come to the second of the Reach the Next Level live stream series. Um, for you who joined me last time, last week, we were talking about the, my core exercises. So I was trying to, last week, to exemplify w what it is to pull your guitar technique apart into very unique, very specific elements. And today we're going to um, <clears throat> continue in a similar way. We're going to continue with the scales. All right. And of course, already playing scales involves many different things like, you know, the right hand. It involves left hand position. It it's kind of involves legato playing. But it's sort of like the scales in a way are like the building blocks of the music. So guys, thank you for joining in here once more. Getting a lot of comments here. And uh, okay. John, good morning from Tijuana, Baja, California, Mexico. It's 10 a.m. Oh, thank you for joining. Yes, good morning, good evening, no matter where we guys are. Klaus, abrazo amigo, gracias. Muktadir, boss playing. Awesome. Thank you for joining in here. Glad to be sharing this particular episode with you about scale playing. And when it comes to scale playing, it's something that we all talk about, we all hear, but for a lot of people that can be like kind of a negative, almost like a negative association, like, oh no, the scales, that's really boring. But I hope with what we're gonna show today, you're gonna feel that, well, after all scale practicing isn't that boring. All right. And we still have, if somebody wants to learn more with me, we still have the limited February offer for 20% off on five lesson bundles. Do take that an opportunity to use that. I am currently uh, focusing a lot on these teaching materials and um, some of you may have already read my article about scales that I'm kind of same concept I'm going to present today. And if you want a little more clarity to that, you can go and look at my article as well. It's based on scale playing. So these days I'm very much involved in producing educational materials. So actually this is a kind of a good time to learn these things from me because they're very fresh on my mind. Anyway, we're going to start a little bit with some um, talking a little bit about scales. So, well, scales, these lovely, it's just a combination of notes. We play them in the order, you know, it's sort of like but in, in tonal music, the scales are kind of the language. So we have the, in, in Western music, we have the major and the minor scales. And that's what we're going to look at. Actually, mainly going to look at just major scale shapes today. And when it comes to scales, what I really recommend is to always start with just one octave. This is a thing that I always um, push for. Start with one octave. Don't try to beat the two and three octave scales. That's instead, let's take one octave and let's get a little more deep into it. A lot of times when we learn scales, it's going to learn a kind of a pattern, which we then memorize mechanically. And now, well, that was C sharp, that was C major. Now in D flat major, you see it was just the same shape. D major and what is happening it's all great but we're just using the same physical um, fingering and shifting it in different positions so actually so most of the times as you're doing this you're not even aware of which notes we're playing so I'm gonna make it a little bit more complicated so that it will force you into being more aware of which notes you're playing so instead of just shifting out into different keys, we're just going to stick with C major for a little bit. And we're going to start off that fingering that I just played is what you can see right out there here, okay? And that is in second position. Okay. And before we even go too far again, I want to, just like I mentioned about this last week, it's very important to pay attention to your thumb. And uh, in this case, because we're playing actually on the, f f you know, the fourth, third, fourth, fifth, and third string, 
the thumb should really not be too low here because as we talked about last week the the net we want kind of the, the what just makes the hand strong is that kind of natural grip like a kind of reaching movement like a fist all right so when we do that we, we're not going to do that with the thumb very low this just makes the whole hand weak and many people have a tendency to uh, maybe put now the thumb very low as if they will be playing on second string but actually now we're going way that low down here so the thumb should almost kind of come up off the side when we can see it of course it's a little too much like this I would say is kind of perfect all right so because otherwise you will have this kind of this will be very very hard work for the fingers like stretching very far you know we want it to be very easy and near a lot of that, of course, is what I talked about last week uh, about the exercise where we are, you know, focusing on one string and then being able to play the other string open under. But of course, that is from from last week, you know. Let me just get this. See if I'm in better and focus right now. Sorry, there's a little bit of an issue with the camera. Let's see if that's better now. I think now is better. So what we're going to go on to now is the second one here. So we're going to play the same scale, all right? But we're now going to play it in the third position. And that's the second example you can see. So sounds pretty much the same, but actually we're diff using a different position. And now in the third example, we're moving to the fifth position. Okay? Last example here, we're in the seventh, in the seventh position, all right? So those were four different positions. It sounds the same, okay? This is really interesting to practice this way. We have some comments here too. Hola, Johannes. Saludos desde Argentina from José. Gracias. Thanks for joining. Daria, good evening from Belarus. Wow, awesome. Uh, Rudolf Duran... Davalos, saludos desde Mexico. Hey, Odegor, Odegeir, from Roslagen in Sweden. Yes, uh, with a lot of snow. Yeah, I'm back in the Netherlands. And we also have quite a lot of snow here. But thanks for joining in about this little chat here about scale. So, to repeat that again. That was the first one. It's the second one in third position. And that was the third third one in the fifth position and last one seventh position in the beginning don't play them that fast take it slowly in the beginning it will just automatically get it fast by itself don't worry here now we're gonna do the same thing in the higher octave okay so I'm gonna start fifth position and now I'm going to do the same scale in the seventh position we're still in C major and then the last one moves between the ninth and the tenth position okay very pretty and again we're just taking the one same scale and just today I'm using C major but we can course in a little bit later I will show some example in other keys too all right now what we did we played an oct one octave scale we did it only um, we did it in one octave we did over three strings no shifts okay pay attention we didn't make any shifts now imagine if we actually start putting in shifts too um, just the possibilities just become crazy many I mean, if you look here, for example, in the first example, I am playing a scale and I'm on the fifth note, on the G, I'm adding a shift. All right, for example, and now I'm going to do that scale in C, ma C major again in fifth position and now 
added a shift from the D to the E. All right, and now comes a higher position one, where I start in third position. All right, there I added a shift on the second note. Here you go, it's a little funny one in the end. Here I shift twice, for example. But what I could do, I can also just, I don't know if this shows any better, no, not really at this moment. What I could do, I could, show, for example, shift on the first note. I could shift on the second. I could shift on the third. On the fourth. On the fifth, like I did in the first example. doesn't make much sense because <laughs> just showing you how many possibilities there were including shifts now but that was just one position and one scale and now I could do the same for example shift on the second so you see now how ma incredibly many possibilities we're kind of really stepping into here all right so, oops, crazy. All right, now we are going to start talk about um, two octave scales, okay? Um, now coming back to, uh, now I'm gonna show you some other keys too. So for example, um, what is very nice about G major because if we're in C, the G major is just, you know, you just go down a string from C to G here. And, and that kind of becomes the same, you know? All right, now the first scale is the G major scale. So let's focus now. That is the first octave. Now let's have a look at the top octave. You know, one of the now because we played the G major, like with a C, you can do it in so many different positions. And if you play G major in second position, you start with the fourth finger. You can see that on the okay. So the G major we played this lower one, the last now the first note and the next octave so it's important to so what happens to we can really memorize an octave at a time and now you see now it became rather than being just two octaves it was really just one and one that I put together so that made it the whole thing a lot easier in my mind this is by my point so I may not being super clear but what I'm trying to say is that basically if you learn the, the one octave scales then you automatically know the two and three octave scales because basically now you just have to patch together those ones you learned all right does that make sense and question from Tia Becker hello from Springfield Missouri awesome Tia so nice to hear from you hope you're well over there do you rec recommend a metronome? John uh, asks here. Um, the, it can be used, uh, definitely. It, in general, for these, as you're approaching these exercises at first, it's more. Imp it's not so much about the rhythm. Take your time, do it slowly, in your own time, finding the positions. And in, in this particular case, it's not that we need to use the metronome a lot. There are other exercises where this can be very powerful. Uh, saying that, if you do use a metronome, I recommend putting it on a high speed. Ding, 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 and then play one note, okay, on each of the of the metronome beats. But very, John, good question there. Of course, the metronome it also depends a little bit on how, generally speaking, to do something like a scales. 
most people are pretty rhythmical enough to, you know, there's not a really complication with doing this. The metronome is a great way to control, you know, are we playing it too fast, for example, then the metronome is good, or do we want to increase our speed, then this, the metronome can also be a good way to measure that. But for most of these exercises, uh, I do not recommend a metronome uh, for most of it because it's also a lot about listening. All right, from Romania, Romania, Anka. Hello, thank you for sharing. Can you describe your approach to basic left hand wrist arm angling with fretboard technique? Curious how do you speak about it? Thanks. From Tia, well, that is a great question. Uh, hello from Francesco. Your live streams are always super interesting. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. You make it interesting by joining. Thank you from Joran Akter. Warm greetings. Dear Johannes, I will spread your marvelous lessons to all around our world. Thank you so much. So nice, uh, Joran, a fantastic composer. All right. Well, that was good. Really good questions. So without getting too carried away from our subjects, I would love to cover those questions. And about what Tia is asking here is a little bit what I was talking about earlier. And one very important thing is, well, the thumb position. That's I would point out as the first thing, because no matter the thumb position would really determine the hand position, believe me. So it's very important to get the thumb in the right place. And there's another big, uh, Question I often get people ask me about this when it comes to scale, scales and the thumb and whether the thumb should continue to move on the back of our neck or not. All right, so this can even be a little bit of a debated subject, you know. And but again, I think most of this there's no reason to have any debate about it because it's simply one can be useful in one situation and the other can be not useful in another situation. There are situations where we're doing very long scales and in that case, yes, the thumb will definitely it will benefit from continuing like a guide. The, the thumb is not guiding the hand. But in these scales that we do, we bounce from up to down and we go down again. So we go... <laughs> case I do not recommend changing the thumb instead the thumb is now a pivot which we move around all right so if you take I can show you a little bit like this so there's a little bit of a kind of you know it's quite amazing we don't think about it but we can use this the shoulder you know can really be used to to, to get the hand in the absolutely right position. And even, even there in the two octave scale, it did make sense for me to keep the thumb in the same place because if I go down, it's fine to go down, but it's hard work to go up again. Eh? This is the thing, going down is okay, but, and what you really kind of want with this kind of scale is, and then, we go back. So in this case, you can really see how my thumb stayed at the same place. And yes, Tia, the, the fretboard position, this it's very much what I touched in um, last week's. So I can see, you can see ugly cable there. That wasn't my attention. That's better. <laughs> so the hand position, yes, it's, it's kind of like, Yes, we want a position that is as natural as possible, all right? So that is where, to really understand that, I recommend those other core exercises in which you are playing a note, two notes on one string, and in a way that the string under, in this case the G string, can be open, all right? In that case, if you're not in this good position, those notes are damped, all right? So, approach for the scale. If I relax my hand like this, right, and for most people, for everyone, if you relax your hand, there is a, you can see it's like a line between these four fingers. Do you see that? All right, it's like a line here. All right, and this line 
I use, you know, that's where I put the string, right? And that's where now that idea that the thumb is the pivot and I'm moving, you see? So this line, I call it the natural line, okay? That if you're just relaxed, so instead of reaching for the string, I just put the hand exactly where it's already like in a line, all right? And then all you have to do is just simply press it down a little bit. Okie dokie, great questions. Now, let's get back to our two octave scale. And what we can see now, let's go to the second one, which is our lovely C major scale again. line there uh, it will be like right there so make it a good pointing finger there it is <laughs> there is the second line I'm playing let's have a look at familiarizing with the lower octave let's familiarize with it no problem these shapes I know them very well now putting them together simply all I do this particular scale has also another feature, which is that if you pay a little extra attention, you will see that each string has three notes on them, okay? C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, all right? E, F, G. So this is a little bit of an example. You can also see that in the fingering part here that AMI, AMI, AMI. This is an example where we can have fun and try out what is so-called three finger scales. And that means three fingers in the right hand. So what I'm doing is I'm using like AMI, like a tremolo. And I'm able to play, this is for me the fastest way I can play a scale, all right? It's with the three fingers. So, but that can also, when it comes to three finger scales, they're optimally also fingered in the left hand in a way where there are three notes per string, okay? Of course, when you do the turning, when you go, then we have to do a round of MI also. MI, okay? And then back to AMI, AMI. It's a really awesome way. and again this this is a, gonna be applied to many different keys works and that is a really cool way to finger a scale when it needs to be really really fast and there are certain cases maybe we need a really fast triplet scale then that three finger thing can be awesome now let's have a look at the one more here yeah. This will be back in third position. A B flat. This is fantastic. This is a B flat major. Oh, sorry. What am I doing? Sorry. This was the same scale as we were doing in C major on the fifth position. It's the same shape, but now it's in B major. And the higher one. And now. It is no problem to put them together. All right, another version of a two octave um, uh, scale. All right, now ah, more complicated. So actually, I wanted to start this whole thing off by saying, actually, let's before we move on there, let's just whoops, the wrong thing. So what I want to say is here in the beginning, I was just showing C major, okay? 
but basically to make it clear we can do this with any key and I generally recommend to say pick a key a day and you can for example use the cycle of fifths so maybe you did C the next day you can do G and we'll do the same challenge yourself find a different find a different finger okay and now let's say that was G and then maybe the next time D etc okay but and then you, you pick a key at a time and it's really like instead of just you know this is now becoming much more than just a technical exercise it's really kind of learning to understand the fretboard by doing this you your sight reading will improve tremendously and you just you're kind of feeling with a fretboard will totally change for example if you're particularly practicing a piece in a certain key say I'm practicing this one E major parallel by Bach then well it makes a lot of sense for me to practice E major scales Awesome after playing those scales. Okay, I'm, before I want to go back a little bit here. Excuse me, a little bit. Uh, oh no, it's not here. That can happen. And one octave to shift. One octave to shift. Okay, so what we're we gonna? I want to talk about one more thing, but this, I don't need to sheet music for that. You can understand this anyway, and that has to do with playing scales on one string. And this is something the uh, string players, the violinists, uh, cellists, etc. This is something quite common to do that you're practicing a scale on one string. And actually, it's a, such a lovely and melodic way to practice scales. And I really, it's something that I love doing. And I recommend everyone to, to also do that on guitar. It makes just as much sense on the on the guitar as it does on the cello, to be honest. <laughs> too and that you can really get this kind of vertical melodic line we know that we finger pieces when we want right it's a kind of a style of playing kind of romantic you want that right so the best way actually to practice to become really good at that kind of cheesy playing is string. For example, this is C here, I have to start, start on the first fret, or I can play D, or there's also, again, we can talk about fingerings here, there's, you, you need at least, at least two shifts. Right? To, to get over the string. You could have, also, you could actually play it all. That also will train something. Actually, it will train your shifts very well. So you could even go that extreme to play with one finger. But better combine with, it, with the other, other fingers too. So playing a scale on one string is a really, really lovely thing to do uh, you will actually by doing that you can overcome a lot of obstacles also about shifting um, and you, you you know it's really training to be good at that kind of 
to sing out on, on, on one string. Uh, Brian, hello. Brian here again. Good to have you back. Thanks for joining us. Joining us. Subham from India. Awesome. Right hand free stroke or rest strokes? Good question. Yes, you see, I haven't even gotten there yet. I will touch that a little bit later. It's, of course... Um, now it's mostly we're mostly talking about the left hand and because this is just an introductory lecture to this i'm not going to spend too much time talking about the right hand but of course it's also a whole other uh opportunity here to practice different fingerings different strokes also using thumb etc but mostly in this session today we're, we're using the scales more as a kind of a left hand orientation but I am going to talk a little bit about the right hand in a bit I did talk about it a little bit with the three finger scales all right but basically rest strokes free strokes practice both you know and it, because there's not and also you know also when, it, when you're practicing different fingerings like for example if you press A and M that should also be practiced in rest strokes too, all right? Most people will have a little bit of a preference when playing scales, free stroke or rest stroke, but I'm quite sure in most cases the preference is quite a lot related to how much you practice one or the other. So for example, if you practiced a lot scales with free stroke, it's going to feel better to do it with free stroke. And because this is scales, this should be, you know, it's something we really, ideally, I think everyone agrees that we should be able to do it in both rest and free strokes. So if you are not so good with a rest stroke, then put some more, use it more. And by just doing it, even if you just do it with slow scales, use your rest stroke then. And all of a sudden it will start to feel more comfortable. It's, it's, um, of course, there can be some situations, and actually, I've written a whole article about the use of free and free and rest strokes. And basically, it really can depend on, on context. If you're playing something very, uh, something like you may really benefit from the from the rest stroke. Okay, then it's great. But maybe you're playing something like. You know some baroque music or something. in those cases it can be if you do can that can then sound too heavy and a kind of a three stroke can then help bring lightness to it you know so there's a kind of different characters and as as artists we should try to develop as many different expressions as possible do you visualize scales in the, context, in the context of chord shapes or do you think about them linearly? That is a great question today. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, it's a very good question. Because of course, when it does come to fretboard harmony, and, and another way of course is chord shapes, you know, that's the other. with you when it comes to the scales I don't think so much about the chord shapes what I really think of course is the starting note all right and the ending note this is very important and then... so no in this case but it, there is a whole other aspect which which is kind of like scale playing similar to scale playing in the sense Arpeggios in order to really know the chords too. But what is the chords is three notes out of the seven. So we still have to learn all the seven. So also by knowing the scales very well, the, the chord shapes will also come much easier. So it's all, you know, related. Hello, Thibaut. Awesome. And uh, uh, Thibaut, I recorded a beautiful um, arrangement of his of... Uh, Moon River, you might have seen it. 
uh, Dean, thank you, he says here. All right, let's move on here a little bit. Talk about great. You guys had so many nice questions. The questions makes it the more fun. And of course, now in this lecture, I'm moving on. You know, if you're just getting acquainted with this, of course, as I started off saying, it's very important to spend a lot of time with just one octave scales. But anyway, we're gonna have to hit some heavier stuff now. And what I want to talk about now is what happens in the scales when we for the shift before the shift we use an open string all right this is something i think a lot of times when we have scales in pieces is quite common sometimes to finger it this way because maybe you, you're here and then you need to be here and then what we do we're using an open string as a way you know, to, to, to leaves an opening. The opening string means time to shift, all right? So you can make shifts that are not then so sort of glissando-like, you know? You can really get... Okay? For example here, this is the first example here. It's a little small, I'm sorry about that on the screen here, but if you take a closer look here, there, here, so what I'm doing in this scale, it looks so big next to me, the music, that looks pretty cool. There, my hand disappeared into it, but uh, if you take a look on this D there, it's an open string and then a shift. octave scale and I used instead of the shifts where well, there were shifts but I used an open string before them this is a super uh, interesting um, trick you know and we, we use it commonly in pieces but I do recommend when it comes to practice our scales that we also do that next one is a kind of a more of a classic scale I mean E major is you know used a lot and here what we do because we have the D sharp we can't shift on the D now uh, we could shift on the A or on the B, all right? So, and, but in this case, we're going to do it already on the A, which means that we're playing on the sixth string, open A, and then continue on the sixth string. So we're also going to get a kind of a very nice fat sound. Okay? And now, when it gets to the E, again, open. You can see that. string can get it very can make it sound very kind of powerful of course sometimes the, the glissando is so lovely all right that has an, a certain effect but sometimes maybe that's not what we want maybe we want it can be done better sorry but anyway that gives you an idea what that is. A third example, just to keep going here, to just, and also if you are looking back at this or you, you're looking at it now, you have your guitar. This is a great opportunity to try these, actually. So it's F major. And here what we're going to do, again, we're going to shift on the D string like we did uh, before, okay? you notice I mean basically there are only certain open strings so it's what is interesting is although the scale is changing we're using the same open string so that's you 
see, I have to think a little bit. And that's the, the point of this. The point is not to become super masterful at it and play them super fast to repeat them over and over again. No, that's not really the point. Rather take, you know, okay, we did F today, now another day, take another one. Here, John is asking, once proficient, should we play with rhythms and dynamics? Ah, you're asking very, yeah, this is kind of a wait 10 minutes or so. I'm about to relieve that part too. This comes with it. But again, you're so clever because you're already ahead of me, but it's coming up. Is the spruce or cedar top better for you? Well, it's, you know, I'm, a, a, for you who know that, I'm involved in guitar manufacturing and creating my own brand. And of course, there's very many interesting things about spruce or cedar you know of course cedar can have a kind of uh, punch to it and a kind of power that can be really attractive all right but to be honest to be really honest with you over time i probably prefer prefer spruce because of the kind of something about the tone that maybe is a little more shapeable i don't know but saying that what this guitar is this is a double top guitar so you can't see that but if you see inside you see that actually there's two layers the top is spruce and the bottom layer is cedar saying that when you do that you really get the most character of the wood that is on top so in many ways this guitar sounds has that kind of spruce kind of pearl like singing creaminess but to be honest, there's something about it. I can also hear the cedar in there, to be honest. As a kind of... So, I mean, this is over the years that's become my sort of favorite type of guitar is the double top guitar, which combines cedar and spruce. And much of it is, I think, because I have a trouble deciding what I like the most, cedar or spruce. So here you can get both. But be aware, when you're getting a double top guitar, what you're getting is... Again, so if it's the spruce is on top, you would get like spruce dominant, all right? You do the same, you put a cedar on top, have the spruce underneath, you get a kind of cedar dominant sound. So you still have to kind of choose. I don't know what happens if we make a triple tri top. We haven't really tried that yet, but, or you know, maybe then you can have two spruces and that was a joke though. Of course, the triple top is a kind of a phenomena that the reason why we do double top is basically to get less mass and I think with the triple top we will kind of start going in the other way we're adding more than we're taking out. Odegaer, yes, three octave scales require some work for me but really interesting. Yeah and you, honestly, the, to be honest with you, I don't think it's so necessary to practice three octave scales very much and when we do practice the three octave scales the trick is to really, like in this case, like I showed, let's go back to that one, that doesn't really hurt. What I'm really doing here is basically giving it three stations because of the shifts, okay? So one station is, so it's just, that is five notes, uh, four notes. Next station is after the shift. And then I have, different scales that we're practicing. One is the other is and the other one is and then and then stop. So then Three octaves isn't like what? Well, three octaves. It's three octaves is really this because we're using the shifts. This is a combination of three stations. You could also think of these stations in octaves. Maybe that is easier in a way. So you can.
so t- t- what seems very for me it was always very overwhelming with the three octave scales and i always hit myself a little bit against those because oh and i got confused and made mistakes but the key was to really you need to memorize them in chunks and then putting those together it becomes as easy as playing one that is the amazing thing about it pedro well uh, thank thank you so much he says thank you for your answer uh brian again here your left hand finger speed is awesome i have learned a lot last week and again this week my thumb tends to be behind the middle finger but my grip still hurts yeah okay very good um it is so important i'm glad you guys are that you are bringing this up about the 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 thumb okay because it's just such a common um, problem let's say Yes, placement is one thing, okay? Yeah, so what you're saying, yeah, it li- probably somewhere place, but it's still cramps. That means you're using the thumb to press too much, all right? And that is w- what I explained last week was a, a, a way to get really good pressure on the thumb. Check, that's the way, good way, way to check it, is to do shifts, all right? So when you shift... If you press too much, you can simply not really move it properly. Now, if you just do a scale, we're not doing any shifts. Here comes a tip for you. What I really want you to do is first try without thumb. Now, after doing it without thumb, just gently test like this. Where would be the best spot, you know, to support now? And now press very little and try to find and maybe press a little but see go from no thumb and then see for example now I'm pressing really hard do I really need to press that hard no not really because actually I can do it without thumb too so what you want is more of a kind of support more than a pressure all right because anyway the hand the, the arm is so much stronger th- th- than your the hand okay so even if you're okay then still this arm you see because the proof is there's no problem everyone can do it you can do it without thumb so you don't really need the power from the thumb the power comes from the arm the thumb is like this kind of support, you know? So the thumb, the hand is not acting like a clam where it's pressing here. This is easy to think, but actually the, the, the pressures come from the arm. And the thumb is merely, so there's a, basically there is a kind of, a, the pressure is going more in this way. So if I'm playing, if I wouldn't have my arm here, it would move the whole guitar. So the, the arm here is, we talked about it last week about arms should be relaxed and heavy, but it's also helping to then create this kind of slight you know, support here because actually the, the left arm is giving weight, not to thumb. And if you do it all with the thumb, this will slow you down tremendously because you cannot play only a few minutes and it's completely exhausted the hand so to to let the pressure of the thumb is very important and it can really make a big change so if you do feel anyone do feel that then this is really something worth paying attention to and when i say pay attention to that can be done during five to ten minutes a day during for example core exercises or something like scale playing do something simple maximum one octave <laughs> and do it now you're not thinking about the notes you're not thinking about anything you're thinking about the pressure of the right hand thumb so this is worth paying attention to now i want to talk about something super fun this is not so often talked about but i and this is a very special kind of scale which i call a campanella scale which is campanella is a kind of effect often used to describe you know the sound you get when 
Campanella means bells, so it's like a bell-like sound you get when you use as many different strings as possible and you let this notes ring over it. Like this, for example. All right? And I'm gonna show you three very awesome fingerings for that. And maybe the best one, or one of the best ones, is D major. Sorry. sound you know it's not like it's kind of a little bit quirky to play it's not so intuitive because also the right hand is a little bit uh, you know gets a little bit uneven you know because of the notes now the second one is parallel key uh, is B minor in two octaves is the that one is so nice and it's also you really have to practice you know to clean in the left hand to have all these notes ringing it's a great exercise and really just really fun um, if you have some time just try these out they're really fun and um, sometimes it can be so nice to use this in when you make your fingering sometimes or you have It almost sounds like a different instrument. I find that pretty cool. Now, somebody said it before, and it's so true. What about the variations? What about making variations? Yeah, here's the thing. Now, if I were to make a book, all right, I want to make a book with all these scales that I'm showing to you and all the possibilities, it would be so thick and it would be so tedious and hard to, you know, it, it wouldn't be any use to really make a book like that. The use is to do this on your own, uh, ideally without music, just take a key and do things. Now, rest strokes, three strokes, right hand fingerings, sometimes I love practicing scales with P and I for example, or just the thumb. Like I showed three fingers, or maybe strange fingers, maybe I and A, maybe rest stroke, maybe not rest stroke, maybe free stroke. And look here slurs, uh, staccato combined with slurs. Pizzicato, this is a we never, uh, of course, pizzicato is one of those extended techniques, but like everything in a way should be practiced on its own. And I cannot think of any better way to practice pizzicato, all right, than with a scale. And why is that? That's because when I'm doing the pizzicato here, as you can see. My hand had to really work its way over all the strings. Huh? All right, and for you who don't know the trick about a, a perfect, a good pizzicato, the trick is to let a hand come from this side and kind of go over the saddle, uh, the bridge. The saddle is here. But now, to really control all the strings you must be able to move it up and down so that's a great one to do and then you can do di also play with things like shifts articulation for example excuse me so I was doing it in pairs Let me... that affects the fingering See, I'm 
challenging myself to do things I'm not used to do. You can do it with so many different ways. So in a way that is, it's like if you were to take this um, scale, you know, if you take this concept, once we start thinking about all the possibilities, including, you know, first we start with one octave, but then we can do two, including shifts, including open strings, including articulation, changing right hand position, thinking the fact that we actually have 24 keys. Now the minor keys, we also have them. Which if you want to, that when it comes to minor keys, it gets more complicated because we have the three different ones. Uh, again there, if you when you're battling the minor keys, I suggest battling one kind at a time. So for example, natural. positions and with all these possibilities it's endless you know I, I, you you couldn't you can't even imagine how many possibilities there are so there's no way we're gonna ever you know have time even to practice all of the different possibilities hardly in a lifetime so so the, and that's a nice feeling for me at least and I think that what we should think about is that do it a little at a time, you know, and, and the, the amazing thing about it is it's, it's always going to be challenging. Even if you've done it years ago, coming back to something, it's always going to be a challenge. And this kind of practice, this kind of scale practice, it should be that challenge every time. If you just go, I know that, no problem. Okay, then you didn't challenge enough. No, let's try, you know, let's try something new. Let's try D flat major. And let's try it, you know... Uh, you know, uh, let's try it in uh, pizzicato. Today. Or. I'm now I even have to use my ear a little bit. I'm telling myself doing slurs in pairs and you see that it's okay I was making wrong notes but I was also finding my place which was really awesome any questions about this it's been a most pleasant session thanks for joining again Johannes saludos y felicitaciones eres un excelente guitarista tocas muy bien gracias from Yuri thank you Jayastrich that's beautiful thank you so much here well thank you for joining in about this <laughs> session about the scales and uh, I'm going to do two more of these reach the next level live streams and for you who also enjoyed my performance live streams they, they're coming soon again too uh, very soon uh, just kind of warming up for it a little bit and um, I'm going to have a lot of nice new music that I would like to share with you too but uh, I think these reach the next level live streams have been uh, feels meaningful and thank you for your questions thanks you for time and I hope this gave you some kind of ideas and um, concepts about you know how to move on with scale practice hopefully something that make it a little bit more interesting and if you want to have more clarity again I, when I write it I've written an article about this pretty much what I talked about today but of course in the article it's all much more a little bit focused in a way so it can be if you something you don't really understand it can be really worth reading that article maybe that also clears a lot of things and well anyway thank you so much for being here in this